Let us open uh, God's word together to Isaiah chapter 26. I have rarely felt that a passage was so well suited to a time, to such a time as this. So we're reading together Isaiah 26. The title for the message this morning is The Song of the Saved. The Song of the Saved. Isaiah 26 and verse 1. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. For he bringeth down them that dwell on high. The lofty city, he layeth it low. He layeth it low even to the ground. He bringeth it even to the dust. The foot shall tread it down, even the feet of the poor and the steps of the needy. The way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me, Will I seek thee early? For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, They will not see, but they shall see and be ashamed for their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. For thou also hast wrought all our works in us. O Lord, our God, other lords beside thee have had dominion over us, but By thee only will we make mention of thy name. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore thou hast visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. Thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified. Thou hast removed it far unto the ends of the earth. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pangs, so have we been In thy sight, O Lord, we have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, And the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, 
until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. We thank God for the reading of his holy and precious word. Why do we sing? There are many reasons. Sadness. In fact, talking uh, to uh, one of you in the last couple of weeks about music. And there are many reasons why we sing. And sadness is one of the big ones in this country. A lot of songs have been written about sad subjects. But then there's joy. There's entertainment. Storytelling, anthems, and on and on it goes. A lot of different reasons to sing various songs. Well, here we have what is called a song. It is telling the account of the nation and telling of God's dealings with the nation and indeed with the world. The wonderful thing about what we do here today, is that it's not um, removed from reality. In fact, the more real life gets, the more applicable is the means of grace. We note, even in the chapter, that the world only turns to God in crises, if at all. But we turn to the Lord at all times, and therefore our turning to the Lord becomes even more precious in these moments, at these points in our experience. It is the song of God's people, specifically of God's delivered people. It will only be sung, we note, when deliverance has taken place. We're told in Scripture to sing a new song to the Lord. It is the song of redemption. It is the song of deliverance. And until then, in this sense, there will be silence. Let us now look at this song. We will see the relevance, as we've said already, of this song to our day, especially in the context of this particular uh, time. Notice, first of all, the reason of this song In verse 1, in that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. What's the reason? The reason is salvation. That's why we are calling it the song of the saved or the song of salvation, the song of the redeemed. What kind of salvation is described here? Look at verse 1 again. It's like a fortified city. But it's a a fortified city that is not physical, but is spiritual. One that God has built. It is the walls and bulwarks of salvation. And therefore, it is not only physically, but spiritually impregnable. Nothing can match the power of this city. In fact, one commentator described this chapter to borrow the, uh, the words of Dickens, a tale of two cities. Again, like Augustine, we have the city of the world and we have the city of God. And the city of God stands in the midst of the city of the world as an impregnable fortress for those who come within its walls. Remember Tyre, I explained to you a few weeks ago, that Nebuchadnezzar attacked Tyre, which was a fortress built off the coast of the actual city, and that became an impregnable fortress. And even Nebuchadnezzar assaulted it for 13 years and could not take it. Eventually, Alexander the Great did. But when God defends his people, when God defends his people and surrounds them with bulwarks of salvation, Nobody will defeat them. And nothing, not even this present crisis, 
not even this present, and it is a crisis, and it is fearful in itself, but we as God's people stand strong, not in our own strength because we are weak, but we stand in the strength of our God. And that's the reason. That's the context of the song. It's not ignoring reality. It is the knowledge of reality. But God has overcome all the things that would normally defeat us. Even death itself, even if some of us are to be taken uh, by this virus, that won't defeat us. That will only usher us into God's glorious presence. Therefore, we can say, where, O death, is thy sting? Where, O grave? Only the believer can say that. Only the Christian can stare into the face of death and the grave and in, in the fear of God can, can mock at death and the grave. But then notice, secondly, in verse 2, the requirement of this song. Open ye the gates. Why? So that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. This is a place of protection. But a place of protection for who? Who is this fortified city for? It is for those who are called the righteous who keep the truth. The question is begged. What is my relationship to the truth? Do I believe the truth as it is in Jesus? The Lord Jesus said that those who are of the truth hear my voice and they do my will. In fact, there is no salvation apart from truth. And the point is this, that this city, this fortified city, is not some mystical experience. It has now become something concrete in the context of truth. In other words, the only way I know I am in this city, the only way I know I'm saved, is when I actually believe and obey the truth. That is the basis, no more or no less. And that is the confidence in our salvation. Thirdly, we have the resource of this song. The resource of this song in verses 3 and 4. What is, or more specifically, who is the resource. Who is it? It's God himself. It says, thou wilt. That is God himself. God personally will keep him in what? Perfect peace. Notice here, not just peace, but what? Perfect peace. Unhindered. Unmatched peace. The Lord Jesus said in the Upper Room Discourse, my peace As John Calvin said on that, the very peace that I enjoy, the very peace that belongs to me, the very peace that I have, my peace I give to you. But what is the means of this? Again, is it mystical? Is it some sort of transcendental experience? Is it sort of some form of Buddhism? No. The means of the the perfect peace is twofold. It's, first of all, to think on God. John Calvin, when he he wrote the Institutes of the Christian Religion, said that knowledge is comprehended in two points, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. We need to know ourselves and we need to know God. And the promise is this, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee to meditate on God. So, Morris Roberts wrote uh, that book, The Thought of God, which is all about meditations on the person of God. You see, when we concentrate on the crisis, when we concentrate on the, on the fear, there is no peace. Isaiah says at least three times, there is no peace, saith my God, for the wicked. But then also we are to trust in the Lord because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. In other words, never stop trusting God. Never stop 
putting your faith in him. Why? Because, as it says in the text, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. We can never wear God out. We can never come to the end of his strength. We can never come to the end of the resource that is our God. So as Leupold in his commentary says, since he cannot waver, neither will the man who has stayed on him. When you're on the rock, you will not be moved. That's what Psalm 46 is all about. Even the world can be removed. But when we trust in the Lord, the Lord does not move and therefore we shall not be removed either. Psalm 112 verse 7 says, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. You see, again, this brings us back to our present context in where we are as God's people. What is our response? Yes, we are not to be foolish. We are not to do, I think we were discussing this in the car on, on the way up. You know, we're not to jump off a bridge and say, well, God will save me. No, no. We are not to do foolish things, but that is not the grounds of our confidence. The ultimate grounds of our confidence is the Lord is in control. That not even a hair of your head can be removed without the will of your God, without the will of your Father in heaven. That's our confidence. That's the fortress that is our faith. That is the confidence that is our conviction in the Lord himself. That whatever happens to us is not only God's will, but get this, is God's will for your good. Romans 8 verse 28. Whatever happens is for your ultimate good, no matter how bad or how dreadful it seems at the time. Fourthly, the recompense in the song, verses 5 and 6. What is God doing in the present situation, which applies to Isaiah's time and our time? He is bringing down the pride of man. He is bringing down the lofty city, the city of the world, them that dwell on high. That's what we see, don't we? You know, we've gone in a few weeks from those who um, to boast and they have the power and they have the answers. Do they have the answers now? No, they are struggling. And they don't have the answers. Yes, uh, we're, and we're not saying that, humanly speaking, that they may be doing their best, but what's, what's revealed is that everything's changed. So big sports events are all called off. Why? Because... Man is in fear. There's fear of death. And the pride of man is being brought down. What is happening now is only partial. A day is coming when it will be complete. See, this is a warning. This is not judgment. This is a warning of judgment. This is God calling the world to repent of its sin. This is God saying, as Christ said in Luke 13, verses 1 to 5, uh, regarding those two tragedies referred to there, uh, that this is a message from God to, to repent or we shall perish. Likewise, perish. How will this be done, verse 6? It's actually done in the sixth verse by the feet of the poor. This lofty city is going to be brought down by those who are poor and those who are in need. So insignificant. Well, listen, you can't get something that is much more insignificant than something you cannot see. What's bringing the world to its knees at the moment and and fear? So the people are going in and basically ransacking supermarkets and and so on. It's, It's an invisible virus. God is using a bacteria that you can't even see to bring the whole world to this point of fear. Of course, in the context of the verse, it is ultimately fulfilled in God using his church. 
to bring the world to its knees. The reminder of the song, just before we, we get to the point of thinking, well, you know, the ungodly, the, 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 they've got the problem. No, verse 7 tells us. Verse 7 is a timely reminder that the way of the just is uprightness. Thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. See, in this situation, God is looking at you. But not just outwardly. God is examining how you will respond in this situation. What do you trust in? Do you fear like the world? Do you flee like the world? Or will you remain steadfast in your trust in the Lord? That's the challenge, isn't it? See, this is where, to use the the modern phrase, this is where the rubber hits the road. It's easy to speak of, of trusting in God when all is well. And some of us have been professing Christians for a number of decades at this stage. And when we were young, when we had all our strength, we were ta- again, we were talking the car on the way up, the way the body is starting to, to fail. And that's where the challenge and that's where the test really begins. Where are you when the trouble comes? What will you do in the day of trial, in the day of visitation? That's the question of God's word. What are we doing? There's one who is weighing his people, weighing them. Remember the words to the king of Babylon, Mini, Mini, Tikal, Eupharsim, thou art weighed in the balance and thou art found wanting. What are we going to be in the balance of God's judgment? And then sixthly, we see the rudiments or the essentials of this song in verses 8 to 9. There's a number of things here that we'll just, again, just briefly refer to. There's a waiting for God. We have waited for thee. Like Psalm 40, the first couple of verses of Psalm 40. There is a desire for God, and that's why we sang Psalm 63. Lord, thee my God, I'll early seek. It says in our text, the desire of our soul is to thy name. There's also a remembrance of God and to the remembrance of thee. You see, our faith finds all its reality in our relationship with God. Our relationship with him is the very core and the very fullness of our faith. Fourthly, it is the soul's desire. With my soul, not just with my time or, you know, I've, I've gone to the service and, and so on. I've read my portion for the day. I've said my prayers. No, with my soul have I desired thee in the night. Listen, the next time you can't sleep, spend time in communion with God. Because God sometimes robs us of our sleep in the night time. In fact, I'm reading a biography of James Henley Thornwell, who was a a Presbyterian minister in the the 19th century. And he said that nighttime was his best time for study. We're all different. But for him, he would would actually sleep on in the morning because he would study into the early hours of the night, maybe three or four in the morning, because there was quietness and there was time alone with God. As Robert Murray McShane once said, better one calm hour with God than a lifetime with man. Better one calm hour with God than a lifetime with man. But also it's a seeking of God. With It says, with my soul, verse 9, have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me, will I seek thee early. Again, Psalm 63. It's an early seeking. Now, when it says within me, there's a thing to understand here. We're not talking about, again, Buddhism. It's not that we find the truth within. That's not what he's saying. It's not, you know, as Buddhism would tell us, look within yourself, find the truth within yourself. No, no. He's saying, from within, from the very depths of my being, I am seeking God. So again, Isaiah 1 says, Isaiah chapter 1, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts are what? Far from me. God wants us to seek him from the depths of our being. So it's no good. It's good to be here. 
It's good to be the people of God and be together. But it's nothing if I'm not truly seeking God from the depths of my being. And so importantly, so importantly, when this will happen, when, now get this again in the context of our present situation, when thy judgments are in the earth, that's when this is going to happen. I'll wait for you, I'll desire you, I'll remember you, I will desire you when thy judgments are in the earth and the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. You see, there's a real sense in which what's happening today is an act of grace. Let, let me contrast that to you with this, with this picture that God never brought trouble to the world and then people just die and go to damnation. That would be an evil God. Do you get the point? Because God is gracious and merciful, he is constantly sending trouble into the world to declare to the world, all is not well. You need to repent. You need to get right with God. These are acts of mercy. This is God telling us the way things are. And yet the reality is, seventhly, in verses 10 and 11, that even when God shows his favor, man will not repent. Look what it says. Let favor, or literally let grace, be shown to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly. In other words, he'll go on in his sin, even when he's surrounded by righteousness. Even when he's surrounded by God's people, he will actually get worse and will not behold the majesty of God. You know, people say there's no evidence. Now, there's lots of evidence. Creation declares the glory of God. But they will not. In other words, they refuse to see God's majesty. They refuse to see it. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see. And be ashamed for their envy of the people. Just one sin is identified. They won't be ashamed for their envy. The fire of thine enemies shall devour them. They'll devour themselves. We see that so many times in Scripture where God turns the enemy against itself. Instead of repentance, instead of seeking the Lord's mercy, they consume themselves in their sin. The goodness of God leads us, or should lead us, to repentance. Eighthly, we have the rejoicing of this song in verses 12 to 15. Very briefly, it's First of all, a rejoicing in what God has done and will do. Verse 12. Lord, thou wilt ordain, Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us. For thou hast also wrought all our works in us. What God has done and what God will do. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. That's the verse I want on my gravestone. And I've said it so many times now. You're not going to forget it. Philippians 1 verse 6. Just in case my family forget, you remember. Because it's God's work, isn't it? It's God's work. That's my only confidence. The longer I live, the less confidence I have in myself. The old, and that's why you see in, in the Gospels that it was the older ones who were, you know, he was without sin, cast the first stone. And we, we see that it was the older ones who were more conscious of their sin. The older, the, every day we live in this world, we become more aware how sinful we are. And that's why, as I said to somebody last week, why would you not trust in Christ? Why would you not flee to him? Why would you not run to the cross for mercy? Also, it's rejoicing in the knowledge of God's unique sovereignty. Verse 13, O Lord our God, other lords have been lots of them. They've had dominion for a time. But we've realized what verse 13 is saying. We realize there is only one true sovereign. There's only one God. There's only one true master. There's only one 
who deserves worship. There's only one who is worthy of all praise. You know, when we get to know great people, so-called great people, you learn very quickly they're actually not that great. But the more we know God, the more we realize how great he is. Amen. Thirdly, it's rejoicing in God's judgment over unrighteous rulers. Verse 14. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore thou hast visited and destroyed them. It's God's work and made all their memory to perish. The memory of the wicked shall perish. The name of the wicked shall perish, but the memory of the righteous is blessed. Do you want to be remembered? Well, then know the Lord. You know, you can, you can, go, you can go around Dublin and you can see various monuments. You can go to Phoenix Park and you can see the, I think it's the largest granite obelisk in Europe, as far as I'm aware, to the Duke of Wellington. It's 200 feet, 205 feet high. I could be wrong on that, but I, I think I've been told that. 205 feet of, of solid granite to remember a man. But if he wasn't a believer, his memory will perish. The only way to be remembered throughout eternity is to know God and for God to know you. See, this is the answer, isn't it? This is the, the application of not only the text, but of the situation that we are in. Fourthly, it's a, a rejoicing in God's restoration of his people, verse 15. Thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. It's not just a restoration, it's an increase. Thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified. So God is glorified in the increase of his people. Yes, he had, as the last clause says, he had removed it far. God had removed it far onto the ends of the earth. In other words, it wasn't central place. That's the idea. It's not that Israel had literally geographically no position. No, in importance, it had been removed. But now it has been restored. You see, when we're living in communion with God, God will raise us up. God will bless us. God will increase us. There's nothing more wonderful than when we obey the Lord and we see the Lord blessing us as a consequence. The church in Western Europe is despised. God is despised. God is dishonored. But God can change all that. In fact, in a very short space of time, God can change all that. We see the Reformation growing out of the the ashes of a Europe that was under the domination of false religion for a thousand years. And in a moment of time, God raises up such a glorious work of grace. The rejoicing of this song. Ninthly, the rebuke of this song. Verses 16 to 19. The first rebuke is to those who only pray in trouble. Look at verse 16. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. Maybe there'll be people who'll go to church today for whatever, of whatever type just because they're in fear. Not fear of sin, not fear of the ultimate judgment of God, but fear of just this situation. The Lord Jesus said in John 6, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, in other words, not because you are convinced of who I was and who I am, but because you had bread. In other words, he's condemning them for not seeking him for the eternal purposes. It's illustrated by a a pregnant woman who instead of a child produces wind. There's a pregnancy and the pain of pregnancy is meant to produce the fruit of a child. But all they produce is air. The question for us from verses 17 to 18 
Are we producing the fruit of the Spirit? Or are we just full of air and not the Spirit of God? We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. The point is, the last clause is, that the church is meant to be so obedient to God. And get this, that the church becomes triumphant and glorious in the world by obeying God. You see, that's where it comes to. It's our relationship to God will bring the victory. And if we are not living in direct obedience to him, there will be no triumph of the church in the world. At least in our own responsibility. Then is the rebuke in light of the day of resurrection. Verse 19. The dead man shall live. There will be a resurrection. Together with my dead body, it is a general resurrection, although Leupold seems to not agree with this, but it seems clear that it's speaking of general resurrection. And therefore, because there's going to be a general resurrection, what is the call? Awake now. Awake now, ye that dwell in the dust. In other words, you're going to be raised, therefore raise now, as Ephesians 5 verse 14 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. We rise now spiritually, because one day we will rise in glorified bodies. Ye that dwell in the dust, for thy Jew is as the Jew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. It's time to live. It's time to stop sleeping. It's time to stop hiding our light under a bowl. It's time to live for Christ. That is the, it's got to be the application of this. It's time to stop the sleep that we are in. And finally, we have the recommendation of this song. And if you haven't been convinced of the application of this chapter to the present circumstances, surely these two closing verses will convince you. The recommendation of isolation in verse 20, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Why? Not in the context of, to hide from the coronavirus, but to hide with God, to be with God, to enter your closet, as the Lord Jesus said, and have communion with the Lord. This is the great need. It's the great need, not only of today, but of every day, to know thy God. They that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. The temporary nature of this isolation in verse 20. Hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. The troubles of this life are temporary. This crisis is temporary. All of it. Paul could say that the afflictions of this time these passing afflictions, these temporary afflictions, these light afflictions are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And finally, we have the reason for the recommendation. Verse 21. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. You see, Again, in the context of Luke 13, 1 to 5, it's not that every person who gets the virus or dies from the virus are worse sinners. The judgment is on the whole of the world. We all deserve to die. We all deserve to get the virus. And we all deserve to go to damnation. And that is the reason of this passage. The earth also shall disclose, uncover 
her blood. And really, it's the idea of uncovering not only death, but all that death stands for, sin and judgment. And shall no more cover her slain. Listen to this brief sentence from Leupold. And he uses the illustration of a a mill grinding corn. Listen to what he says. Powerful words. God's mill grinds slowly, but grind exceedingly fine. God's mill grinds slowly, but grinds exceedingly fine. When God judges the world, it will be complete judgment. And that's why, as Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon Amen. The Lord bless his word to our souls. Let us conclude with Psalm 72 and verses 17 to 19. Psalm 72, verses 17 to 19. His name forever shall endure. Last like the sun it shall. Men shall be blessed in him and blessed. All nations shall him call. Psalm 72, verses 17 to 19, let us stand to sing. His name forever shall endure, last like the sun it shall, man shall be of this time but in each circumstance of life we will learn the answer is to know God to trust in him and we shall not be moved Lord teach us the lessons of thy word teach us these gospel principles and may Christ by his spirit dwell richly in our hearts by faith. Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.